Okay, so uh, hello everybody. Good evening from Belgium and good afternoon to everybody in Montreal. Uh, so thank you, first of all, to the organizers uh, for the kind invitation. Uh, I'm uh, Unfortunately, I could not be uh, in person in Montreal at this time. I've had a very good time at one of the previous conferences in this series in Montreal in person, and I certainly hope uh, to be back at CRM uh, at some point in the future. So today I will be uh, speaking about uh, graphical calculus for quantum vertex operators, which is a joint work uh, with Nicolas Shatikin and Jasper Stockman. Um, so what I'll be starting with first is uh, the existing graphical calculus for ribbon categories. Um, and then I will uh, tell you something about how we uh, extended this graphical calculus to uh, certain larger uh, categories of quantum group modules. So uh, what I mean by a ribbon category is the following thing. We will need a monoidal category, which is equipped with a lot of structure. Uh, namely, we have abrading, which uh, are isomorphisms that will uh, reverse the order in the tensor products of the uh, objects of our monoidal category. We will also have uh, a twist, which are natural automorphisms of the identity uh, in our category, satisfying this property with respect to the tensor products. And we have left and right duality, meaning that to each object, say V, in our uh, category C, we can assign a dual, so V star, and also uh, evaluation and co-evaluation morphisms. So these give us a way uh, to go from a tensor product of a dual object tensored with uh, the original object itself to the unit object in our uh, category C. Uh, or for the co-evaluations, we have the same thing but with the opposite orders. And we also change the orders there of the objects and the duals. And they satisfy these nice uh, properties. So we have this for left duality. And then the right duality will basically be the same thing, but with the orders of objects and duals also reversed. And there's certain compatibility relations between the different structures. Now, this is, of course, a bit abstract in general. Uh, the example that I will always think about when I talk about ribbon categories is the category, which we call MFD, of all the finite dimensional modules for the quantum group UQG. So uh, by quantum group, I mean uh, quantized universal enveloping algebra of a semi-simple algebra G uh, in the sense of uh, Drinfeld, Drinfeld Jimbo. Um, so I will fix also the uh, corresponding Cartan subalgebra. Uh, and so in this sense, uh, for this example of a ribbon category, we have that the braiding is simply given by the action of the R matrix, the universal R matrix in our quantum group, acting on the tensor products V tensor W, two objects V and W in our category. Uh, together with this P, which is simply just a transposition, um, so sending A tensor B to B tensor A. Have is a twist. This twist will be the action of this element theta, uh, which is formed by taking the inverse of the universal R matrix, then acting on this with the inverse of the uh, of the antipode on the second tensor leg, then doing opposite multiplication, sending a tensor b to b multiplied with a, and then multiplying this with q to the power two rho, where rho is in fact half the sum of all the positive roots uh, of the of the root system corresponding to g. So this thing will give us something which is central in our quantum group. And then the twist is the action of the central element uh, on a module V uh, for the quantum group. Then we also have left duality. And these are, in fact, the left duality. This is a very simple structure. What we do is, uh, for the evaluation, we take a dual vector and we take a vector in our module V. And we'll just send this to uh, this dual vector F acting on V. This will certainly give us a scalar. What we do for co-evaluation is we say we take the scalar one and we send it to the sum over all elements of V in a certain homogeneous basis for our module capital V. So a basis consisting of weight vectors. And we take for each of the vectors in this homogeneous basis, we take a tensor product of the vector together with its dual vector. We also have right duality. Now, what does right duality mean? Um, one could say, okay, can we just do the same thing, but with the orders reversed? Can we send V tensor F to F acting on V? Well, this will not give us something that is linear for the quantum group. So in order to have UQG linearity, we'll need this extra factor Q to the power two rho for the evaluation and Q to the power minus two rho for the co-evaluation. All right. Then what we will do uh, when, when we work with these kind of categories is we'll not work with the categories themselves, but with their strictifications. Uh, um, so a theorem, a construction, in fact, by McLean, tells us that we can always go from uh, monoidal categories to strictified monoidal categories by saying, OK, this new category C strict, we define it to be the category with as objects just tuples of objects in the original category C. 
Uh, so tuples of any length k, including tuples of length zero, which would then just be the empty set. And then as morphisms, we say that, okay, the class of morphisms between two such tuples, V1, Vk, W1, Wl, will be identified with the class of morphisms in C between the corresponding objects in C that are formed by just tensoring the different components of Vi or Wi. And when we do these multi-fold tensor products, what we in fact mean is that we always tensor from right to left. And this is in fact also the reason why we work with these quickified categories, because we want to fix the order in which we take the tensor products. And then what we'll do is uh, we'll, of course, also need an extra uh, notion for a tensor product in a strictified category. This, this will be uh, this box notation, uh, which acts on objects just by concatenation of the different tuples. And as a short notation, we'll introduce this tensor equivalence abstract, which just sends uh, this, this tuple S to the corresponding uh, multifold tensor product as an object of the original category C. Then as building blocks for the corresponding graphical calculus corresponding to these ribbon categories, well, the main building block will be the one that we have here on the first line, saying that if we have any uh, morphism A uh, in the strictified uh, category, uh, going uh, between these tuples V1, Vk, W1, Wl, what we'll do is we'll denote this by this box, and we will always use the convention of reading the diagrams from the bottom to the top. Okay, so we go, in fact, uh, in the opposite direction of the arrows in order to read the actual diagram. Now, for certain specified um, morphisms, we will introduce other notations that are specifically used for these uh, special morphisms. For example, for the braiding, we'll have this kind of uh, overcrossing from, uh, from the right to the left. Uh, this will be just the uh, braiding on uh, V tensor with W. Uh, the inverse of the braiding will then be an undercrossing from the right to the left. If we have identity morphisms on dual uh, objects, what we'll do is we'll reverse the order of the uh, of the arrows. So an, an arrow going upward labeled by V actually means the identity on the dual of V. And then we'll have different cups and caps to, uh, to denote, in fact, the evaluation, the right and left evaluation and co-evaluation morphisms. Okay, and you see that this is, uh, this, this is um, consistent with our notation uh, of the orientation of the arrows for the dual objects and the object itself. And then Rishitikin and Toraev have proved already in the beginning of the, of the 90s that this identification between uh, morphisms and uh, diagrams is actually functorial. There exists a strict tensor functor going from the category of uh, C-colored ribbon uh, diagrams uh, or, or ribbon graphs, which is precisely the, um, the category formed uh, by all of the diagrams constructed for, uh, from these building blocks, going in fact to the strictified category corresponding to C. So we, one can actually make this identification between uh, diagrams and morphisms in a functorial way. There's, of course, certain local topological moves that needs to uh, be mentioned uh, So for the, for the diagrams, certain moves that are satisfied by the diagrams. Uh, the one that we have here is, just, of course, expressing uh, the, the, fa the fact that the universal R matrix satisfies uh, the, uh, quantum uh, the quantum yang maxwell equation. We, of course, also have this one, which tells us that, indeed, the, the morphisms, the diagrams that we have for the braiding and its inverse are really also as diagrams each other's inverse. And then we have these ones giving us, in fact, uh, several uh, different ways of uh, specifying the twist. So these loops, uh, these individual loops are, in fact, representations of the twist or of the inverse of the twist, like this one, of course, is then, of course, the inverse of the twist morphism. And it actually consists of different diagrams, namely cups and caps, that we see here in the circular part, and then also, of course, a braiding that we see here for the crossing. And then, of course, an example of a full diagram that one can make uh, inside this, uh, this graphical calculus for ribbon categories would then be something like this. Now, what we would like to do is to generalize this, in fact, to Verma modules for quantum groups. Now, this will not be able with the present uh, graphical calculus because of the fact that any category containing uh, the Verma modules will no longer be a ribbon category because the dual to uh, Verma module will no longer be a Verma module with respect to the same fixed models of algebra. Okay, so this is why we need to extend our graphical calculus to a larger category um, of quantum group modules. And the structure that, that structure that we will need for this is, in fact, a structure of a braided monoidal category with twist, which one can think of as a ribbon category, but without the duals. 
Uh, and the canonical example that we will use for this is this category of what we call admissible quantum group modules. So these are modules satisfying all of these uh, properties. And basically, you can think of this category as it's uh, the BGG category O for the quantum groups, but we do not require the modules M to be finitely generate. But especially, of course, uh, the category O will be a subcategory of this category of admissible quantum group representations. And also, in particular, it, of course, contains all of the Verma modules. So we'll denote by M lambda the Verma module of highest weight lambda. Um, then if we want to specify what graphical calculus means for these kind of uh, categories with less structure without these zools, we have to, also, of course, also specify the building blocks. And the first three ones will be the same uh, as before. But then, of course, we, we don't have, in fact, arrows pointing upwards as single diagrams because we do not have duals. We don't have cups and caps either. But what we do have is, this, is the twist and its inverse. These will still be represented by this kind of loops that we also know from the graphical calculus for ribbon categories. But now the main difference is that we have to consider them as single diagrams that are indecomposable. So before we had, we can really decompose them from cups and caps and braidings. Now we have to view them just as a single indecomposable diagram. And then, of course, this would be an example of a diagram, a full diagram uh, in this graphical calculus for uh, graded monodal categories with twists. And then it could also be viewed as uh, a diagram inside the graphical calculus for ribbon categories. But the other way around, of course, will not, al will, will not always work. All right. Um, then um, what we've done in our paper is we've shown that this uh, this identification is still uh, functorial. So we still have a strict tensor functor uh, connecting the diagrams to the uh, morphisms in a strictified category. And what we'll now do is we'll write dot equality. In fact, so for, for two uh, diagrams, L and L prime, we'll write L is dot equal to L prime to say that their images under this uh, modified restricting to derived functor, uh, their images are equal. Uh, and so in this sense, with this kind of dot equality as a notation, we now have that composing two morphisms is indeed equal to uh, stacking the diagrams, in fact, uh, vertically, and that taking tensor products is really stacking the diagrams horizontal. Then there's one more element that we'll need to introduce for this graphical calculus, which is the notion of fusion. This was, in fact, something that was already lacking, in fact, from the existing graphical calculus for ribbon categories. So there it can also already be uh, be well be, be defined, but it was not done uh, before. Uh, so what we uh, can do is we can look at this class of morphisms in the strictification of C, going from a tuple S of length K, so if you want to be K, to the object of length one that is constructed by taking this F strict of S, so this, this multifold tensor product, and then considering this object as just an object of length one in the strictification. What we now have is that this class of morphisms in the strictified category is by definition equal to the class of morphisms in the original category C, uh, going from F strict, F strict of S to itself. And so in particular, in this class, one can choose just the identity morphism. And then we say, OK, we just take JS, the fusion morphism, as the strictified version corresponding to this identity. So this means that algebraically, it's just the identity morphism, but categorically, it is not, since it goes from some object of length k to just an object of length 1. And so this kind of uh, fork diagram uh, will then be uh, our notation for the fusion morphism, and this one on the, on the right here will be our notation for the inverse fusion this have as an advantage? Well, we, for example, have that if we have a lot of gradings like this uh, here in the left uh, and left hand side, what we can do is we can just take, in fact, fusion and diffusion. Uh, so we fuse uh, in, in the bottom and we diffuse again in the top. And what we are left with in the right hand side is just a single grading. And then, of course, these single gradings are much easier to manipulate. And there's also other uh, reasons to introduce the fusion morphisms. Namely, we can dyna dynamicalize them. Then they will give rise to dynamical fusion. This is something that I will come back to later on. Now, uh, let us take a look at uh, what we mean by quantum verdicts operators. So for this, we'll need the notion of a regular or generic weight, which is an element of the dual of our Cartan matrix, satisfying this property uh, for any root alpha in our fixed root system. And we'll also denote by M lambda, just a fixed highest weight factor in the Vera module corresponding to the highest weight lambda. 
So then it was shown uh, already a long time ago, and there's a lot of proofs uh, around, for example, in, in uh, the books by uh, Etikov and Latour, there's proofs for this theorem, saying that if lambda is just such a generic weight, and V is a finite dimensional quantum group module, then we'll have that V uh, as a vector space graded by the dual of uh, our uh, quantum, uh, of our Cartan subalgebra H is in fact isomorphic to this space. So this uh, tensor, so this, this uh, direct sum of uh, the spaces of uh, quantum group intertwiners going from the verbal module M lambda to some verbal module with a shifted weight tensored with V, where we shift, where we sum in fact over all uh, the shifts that we can have in this weight. And so what does this isomorphism do? Well, it simply sends this tuple of uh, quantum group intertwiners to what we get when we uh, take highest weight to highest weight components of such an intertwiner, right? So we uh, act with this intertwiner on the highest weight factor, and then we take here the dual to this highest weight factor such that we end up with something in V. So this is an isomorphism uh, of H star graded vector spaces. And then we can, of course, take its inverse and we'll write a phi lambda V for, in fact, the image of the vector V inside our module capital V uh, under the inverse uh, of this isomorphism. Uh, and then in particular, what we'll have is that phi lambda, phi, phi lambda V will be in a, a quantum group with its wider from the verbal module M lambda to the verbal module with highest weight lambda minus the weight of our corresponding vector V, tensored with V, and in particular, it will send the highest weight factor in this verbal module to something of the form the corresponding highest weight factor tensored with the vector V, plus what we call lower order terms, which are basically terms that are of lower weight in the verbal module, and then of course, correspond correspondingly of higher weight in the module V. Okay, so these phi lambda Vs, these will be what we call one-point quantum vertex operators, and then the k-point versions of this uh, are, are uh, constructed by taking k different uh, finite dimensional quantum group modules, say V1 until Vk. In each of these modules, we uh, specify a vector, which is a, a vector of a certain weight, say Vl of weight mu L, and then we construct first uh, phi lambda Vk, so this goes from a verbal module to another verbal module tensor with Vk, We'll leave this VK, this finite dimensional module, uh, invariant, but we'll act on the ver on the verbal module with yet another one point uh, vertex operator. So then we go to uh, some verbal module tensor with VK minus one tensor with VK, and so on until we get something of this form. This is what we call a K point quantum vertex operator, and then we'll denote by capital phi lambda V1 VK, in fact, a strict defined version of these uh, K point uh, quantum vertex operators. So instead of the, the multifold tensor products here, we'll take this strictified versions, versions, so just the tuple notations as right. Then what we did is we, of course, introduced graphical notations for these uh, k-points quantum vertex operators. So for example, if phi is of this form, then we are we're going to uh, denote it like this as a diagram. So what we did is we have uh, colored each of the verbal modules in red to make the distinction with finite dimensional modules. And also we have rotated the diagrams over 90 degrees. Um, one reason why we do this is that otherwise our diagrams just tend to become very long, but there's also more fundamental reasons, which will become clear uh, very soon. So we have this kind of diagrams. We also have diagrams where we do strictification of the black strands here, V1, Vk, into a single strand labeled by the tuple S. And then what we have is that as a notation for the full uh, k points quantum vertex operator phi lambda v1 vk, we use this notation. So we specify in blue each of these expectation values, so each of these individual highest weight to highest weight components. And one of the goals of our uh, project will, uh, uh, has been, in fact, to be able to translate uh, morphisms that act on the black strands right here onto morphisms that act on these parameterizing spaces. This is something that I'll come back to very briefly uh, in the end of the talk, but this is in fact the main reason why we did this rotation over 90 degrees, because it will be uh, it will make it very clear, uh, in fact, graphically, how to translate uh, morphisms on the black strands here uh, onto uh, morphisms on the parameterizing spaces. Okay. And then uh, I will uh, show you, in fact, the power uh, of this graphical calculus uh, by means of uh, the following proof of this lemma. Now, this lemma in itself will not tell you much, but it will be useful, in fact, uh, as an intermediate result for something uh, that I will, I will prove later on. Uh, so how can we prove this algebraic lemma? So if you have to prove this algebraically, it will uh, require a lot of calculations. It will be very difficult. Now, graphically, it's, in fact, very clear what we do. Namely, what we do is we start from a 
single uh, quantum verdict operator, say phi, and we compose it with the quantum Casimir and its inverse. So here uh, on the left and on the right. Since this thing is linear for the quantum group, we can translate the action of this quantum Casimir uh, all the way to the spaces here on the left. And in, uh, in doing so, we'll get two Brady's, which is what we see here, and also two quantum Casimirs, one of which cancels with the one that we have here. So we're left with just a single quantum Casimir here. And now our goal will be to uh, make sure that all of the difficult elements, all of the complicated uh, components are only on the black strand, so only on the finite dimensional modules. So what we now do is say, okay, we have here this black strand. It in fact does twice an undercrossing, right? So it undercrosses both here and here. So I hope you can see, see my cursor now for, for where I'm pointing on the screen. So we have these two undercrossings. And so then this, this means that uh, topologically, this is equivalent to say, okay, we can just move the black strand all the way again up to uh, the right so that we get a single undercrossing here. So we get this loop right here. Then as a second step, we'll do this for a three point composition of quantum vertex operators. If we start from taking the quantum Casimirs on this strand labeled by lambda one and on this strand labeled by lambda two, so we get the same kind of loop constructions like before, and we do a bit of more uh, deformations, then we'll end up with this loop labeled by S2 that goes all the way around, in fact, our uh, quantum vertex operator, and then uh, in a, as a final step, we'll just make the uh, correct kind of identifications for pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, and we'll end up with this algebraic lemma. Okay, good. And now why is this lemma useful? Well, it will uh, give us some kind of identity for what we call dynamical fusion operators. Uh, and these are the following things. So first of all, in order to be able to say something about dynamical fusion operators in a graphical way, we'll need to know how to impose boundary conditions in the graphical calculus. Uh, this will be, in fact, very simple. What we do is that if we evaluate some kind of morphism in a vector, say M, then we'll just uh, make, uh, we we'll just take the strand labeled by M and we'll have it end in uh, a circle labeled by the vector uh, small M. And we'll do the same thing for applying uh, a vector F in the dual to our uh, module uh, capital M here. Uh, in the special case where we take evaluation in a highest weight factor or uh, act if or if we act with the dual uh, to a highest weight factor, then we'll just denote it by these small uh, circles. Um, and then another important thing to remark here if we, if we impose boundary conditions is that, in fact, we are no longer working with quantum group modules in a categorical sense, um, since uh, when we are imposing boundary conditions, we, of course, lose the quantum group linearity of the corresponding uh, morphisms, so we have, in fact, um, implicitly applied the forgetful functor from the quantum group modules to the category which we call NFD, which is the, precisely the tensor category, the symmetric tensor category of finite dimensional vector spaces created by the dual of our Cartan subalgebra. This means that overcrossings and undercrossings will no longer have a meaning uh, in this graphical calculus for this, for this new category. So what we'll need to do is we'll need to replace them by these kind of categories where we have full crossings together with a, a coupon labeled by the universal R matrix to really uh, get, have the same meaning as an over or undercrossing in the original graphical calculus. And what we also have is that if we want to uh, work with right or uh, so with right evaluation or right co-evaluation, we'll need to explicitly specify uh, the fact that we are acting here with q to the power two rho or q to the power minus two rho. Okay, and then uh, we can uh, define dynamical fusion operators. Namely, what we do is we'll uh, define J as lambda to be precisely this endomorphism that sends this uh, tuple of vectors, so this, sorry, this, uh, this tensor product of, of vectors V1 till Vk to, in fact, what we do is we take the corresponding k points quantum vertex operator, and then we take highest weight to highest weight components uh, of this uh, vertex operator. Um, and then the actual dynamical fusion operators are, in fact, the strictified versions of these. So where we go from something of length k to, again, something of uh, length 1. Uh, so what this actually means is that, well, we take our k-points quantum vertex operator, then we'll take these highest weight to highest weight components, so the circles on the red strand, and then we'll need to, uh, to apply, in fact, an additional... Um, well, an additional uh, non-dynamical uh, fusion operator, so which is this fork diagram uh, in on the black strands, in order to go really to something which is of uh, which is a tuple of length one. 
All right. So these are dynamical fusion operators. And um, so one more thing that we will need in order to be able to go to the proof of uh, the generalized ABRR equations is in fact this action of the universal R matrix on uh, highest weight factors. This is something that one can also show very easily uh, algebraically. Um, and it's also part of our uh, strategy of getting rid of all the complicated components on the verbal modules, but removing all of the complications, in fact, to the black strands, which are finite dimensional modules. So basically, uh, universal R matrices leave markings by the highest weight of the verbal module on the corresponding finite dimensional module strands. Okay, and so what will be our generalized ABRR equations then? Well, they will be equations uh, for these uh, dynamical fusion operators. They are of the form that the dynamical fusion operator composed with some kind of Cartan elements acting on the modules at VI, uh, VI plus one until VK, or basically I can be any index between one and K, is equal to, well, the composition of a certain uh, universal R matrix with the order reversed, composed with, again, a Cartan term, composed with the inverse of the corresponding uh, universal R matrix, but now acting on different uh, components on different uh, strands, composed again with the dynamical uh, fusion operator. How we can prove this is we can go back to the proof of the previous uh, lemma that we had. So there's this uh, algebraic lemma. So there we had this kind of equality. If we now impose boundary conditions on both sides, then it will uh, come down to something like this. And then if we uh, apply our lemma saying that, okay, these things with this R matrix together with highest weight components uh, can be reduced to just uh, markings by the corresponding highest weight. Uh, and we also contract a loop here labeled by S2, then we'll end up with something like this. And this then, upon making, again, the correct identifications for the vertex operators phi1, phi2, phi3, um, and doing some uh, other technical details, will reduce to these equations for the k-point dynamical fusion operators. And we call them generalized ABRR equations because there's a well-known equation uh, named after uh, the people who have, uh, who have uh, derived this equation first, so Anadon, Buffenoir, Ragussi, and Roche. Um, so this, uh, this uh, existing ABRR equation is in fact a special case uh, of the equation that we have found, uh, namely in the case where we take k equal to 2, so we just consider two points dynamical fusion operators, and we take the index i also equal to 2, then we'll find from our equation the original ABRR equation, um, which is known to in fact um, be an equation that defines the universal dynamical fusion operator. And we also believe that our equation uh, defines a universal version, in fact, for the k-points dynamical fusion operator. All right. Uh, then just very briefly, I will mention some further developments that are also present uh, in the two papers that we've written about this. Uh, first of this is uh, what we call dynamicalization of morphisms. Uh, so we have defined a dynamical version of this module category of finite dimensional quantum group modules. Um, and with respect to this new category, we have defined what we call a dynamical twist functor. So going from the strictification of the finite dimensional quantum group modules to the strictification of this dynamical module category. And basically, what this does is it assigns to each morphism in uh, the strictification of MFD, it assigns, in fact, a dynamical counterpart. So it allows to assign, in fact, a, a dynamical parameter, say lambda, to each of these morphisms of this form A. So basically what we have is that, indeed, we have that we can uh, translate morphisms on the black strands to morphisms, in fact, here on the blue strands. And the definition that we will need for this is uh, what we have here. So it's basically composite position of uh, non-dynamical fusion operators with the fusion operators with this red dot. These are precisely uh, our notations for the dynamical fusion operators. Uh, something else that we do is we study uh, normalized twisted trace functions uh, of k points quantum vertex operators. So these are uh, structures that uh, are, in fact, well studied in the literature. For example, Eitingov and Varchenko have done a lot of work on these twisted trace functions. We have now found graphical representations for them. And moreover, we have found that our graphical calculus allows to derive certain new equations for these twisted trace functions. Uh, so what we've done is we have recovered the dual uh, QKZB equation 
equations, standing for Nisnik Zamolodzik of Bernard's equations. We've also recovered the McDonald Reisner's equation uh, found uh, by Etienne Varchenko. And we've, in fact, found more uh, different kind of types of these McDonald Reisner's equations, namely, where Etienne Varchenko have found just one single equation of this type, we have found one such equation for each spin component, so in this case, k in total. Um, and we believe that they will all mutually commute. And in this sense, um, we have that this uh, original integrable system that is underlying in, in uh, so uh, that is underlying this theory, so in which the eigenfunctions are precisely these twisted trace functions, is now not only a quantum integrable system, but even a quantum super integrable system, precisely because these McDonald Reisner's operators that we have found are in fact additional uh, conserved quantities, conserved integrals for this system. All right, so I believe that that was everything that I wanted to say. Uh, I hope I've given you a nice introduction uh, to this topic. So I'll refer to uh, my, both of my papers that I've written about this together with uh, with uh, Nikolai and Jasper. Um, so the one, this one, the first one here is already on the archive, and the second one will soon also be on the archive. All right, thank you. So I had one just to sort of clarify the connection with things that I at least understand better which is the original vertex operators of Frankel, Resch, and Tiki. Mm -hmm. So they were dealing with affine um, algebras with uh, level one highest weight modules, for example. But here you have Verma modules, uh, which in that context will be level zero, I, I see. So are these different objects, these vertex operators then? Um, I'm not so very familiar with, uh, with the level one versions. But what I do know is that since you've mentioned that it's 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 really a fine case in in this sense, uh, things will become quite different if you're working in the affine case. Okay, so this this is not the affine case. This is uh, is infinite dimensional Verma modules in the. Yes. So so the the the, the Lie algebra G will still be semi simple in this case. And and do you have an interpretation of what the solutions of these QKZ equations correspond to physically in the in these cases or? Um, so physically, um, well, what we in fact have is that they are uh, asymptotic uh, versions of what would physically in, in, in CFT be considered as, as quantum vertex operators. Uh, asymptotic versions in the sense that there will be a certain uh, weights which will uh, be sent um, to infinity basically inside a positive uh, wild chamber. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much again.